Hey there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every other week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. If you are a painter who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, and how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million and a half times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community. You'll be inspired to create and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community, but make sure that you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. My guest this week is the artist John Lee. Originally from the South, John currently teaches in Virginia at the College of William and Mary. He paints interior landscapes that primarily focus on color and space. John has taken to heart the idea that rhythms in nature are endlessly fascinating. He loves playing with images that have at least some architectural elements in it. He's fascinated with vertical and horizontal planes. John describes himself as a responsive painter. He paints what strikes him in the moment. It's less about documenting what's there than it is about the particular moment he's experiencing. We talk about labels and how, yes, it does help to rein in all the possibilities, but they are also constraining and never totally accurate. He's currently on a scheduled leave from teaching, which gives him a glorious nine months of pure painting time. John shares what he's working on and what inspires him to create. And we also talk about the absence of curation in the art that we're exposed to now. The sort of pros and cons of the fact that we have instant access to everything, while at the same time, anyone can attach themselves to an art movement. So we talk about those things and a whole lot more. Without further ado, here is John Lee. John, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I am really excited to talk to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. It's, uh, as they say, it's an honor to be asked. Tell me a little bit about when you first sort of made the move to be a professional painter. I grew up in the South. I finally went to Philadelphia. I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. When I first took my first real fine arts class, you know, that, that was very magical. I mean, I'd, I'd always drawn all my whole life from the very beginning through, you know, elementary school and all the way through, I was always a school artist, but, you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do after high school. And, you know, but I was always interested in drawing and art in some way. But when I first took my first art class and I'm someone who, you know, my father is a teacher, so I'm, you know, second generation. Both my parents actually went to art school. When I took my first art class and I started taking art classes with him, as well as other instructors at this school, this was down in Arkansas, you know, just all this stuff happened. I just suddenly kind of saw this whole world I hadn't seen before. And I started devouring art books and it opened up a relationship with my father that I hadn't quite had before. But then it's sort of like those two moments, the first art class and then going to Philadelphia. So I'm curious if, you know, growing up with two parents who are both artists, what was it about that class that you hadn't seen before at home? You know, I hadn't done art quite like that. I hadn't done art, you know, from the figure or from life or thought about kind of the, the you know, the grand tradition, you know, you know, I'm speaking really of like Western art, you know, I haven't, I hadn't looked at that. I've been aware of, you know, pop artists and so on. When I was in high school, I was very into graffiti art and that interested me. And I was always, always drawing through, you know, cartoons and comic books and that sort of thing. I wasn't quite aware of this, di- you know, the great dialogue as it might be called. And so I started looking at these textbooks and then just, they just kept spinning out into other artists I, I wasn't quite aware of. And I could see them in, in a way that I hadn't before because I was doing it. You know, if you, if you make mm-hmm. art, then you can see other artists in a way that, you know, if you just read about them or see them on the wall, they don't mean nearly as much, I don't think. But if you actually, you know, just draw from a still life, then, you know, you start to see what cubism means. You start to see, uh, you start to begin to slowly see, you know, Cezanne and so on. So it's really interesting. And I love actually the comment about being able to understand and see more because you're putting it into practice. You know, I, I'd realized that early on, I think, but then 
I saw it again in the painter Mercedes Matter, who kind of started the New York Studio School, and mm-hmm. I've been interested in their ideas a lot, and I was into Hoffman, and you know, later in the Graham Nixon teaching, and all that kind of whole New York School. There's a you know essay that you may know about that's you know so it's something like you know how do you learn to be an artist or something like that. It came out about 1973 or four, and it's online if you look around for it. But you know she's talking about that. She's saying that drawing is essential and that you can't really understand someone like she uses the example of Mondrian. You can't understand Mondrian if you haven't drawn, you know. Mm. I think I had that same experience with Mirandi that when I saw his drawings and then tried to to because they're they're deceptively simple. Yeah. And then when I drew, you know, like copied his drawings, which seems on the surface like so easy, but then you become intimately engaged with his paintings and you can kind of start to understand what he was thinking and sort of the brilliance behind it. So I imagine you experience that same thing as you're working through things. Yeah. And just different, you know, I mean, I related to, I mean, for one, you're thinking, maybe thinking of like a, a sort of a mentor I had briefly when I was teaching at Delaware College of Art and Design, there was a painter named James Lecky and he said something about Mirandi you know, Lucky's L-E-C-K-Y. But he, he said uh, something like uh, a little thing on him, like easy to imitate, hard to duplicate or something like that on Mirandi. Like it looks, like you say, it looks deceptively simple. But then when you do it, all these things come into play. It's almost like Mirandi is almost like a, you know, I, I relate him to Albers, you know, because it's just, it's just like a few colors, but getting those colors specifically right in relation to each other is very difficult. And you can get something that kind of looks like it. You know, you can paint three squares, you can paint a couple of bottles on a wall and a shadow, but to get them to kind of sit where they're not separating and they're not connecting too much, that's the difficult thing. And, and that's what, I mean, that's kind of what painting's about is putting those forces together. For someone who hasn't seen your work before, how would you describe it? It might depend on if they're looking at it or if they've seen it or if I'm just describing it over the phone (laughs) blindly. But, you know, I paint based on what I see. I don't really invent things. And it it kind of is based on genres, like uh, traditional genres, like still life landscape self-portraiture. I don't really paint from the figure. I don't really want to deal with people too much, but they may not be strictly that, you know, like it's, uh, I kind of think of like the still life is a landscape and the landscape is a still life. I don't really do landscape too much, but I do sort of interiors, but I want them to be seen more like a landscape rather than, you know, they're not about that place. They're not about my living room or the place I work or something like that, or a kitchen and utilitarian function of it. They're about just kind of the space and the visual dynamics and the kind of the way the light creates some interesting shadows or colors or forms and the way things sit and move versus them being about like a theatrical kind of a world. Like the, it's a stage set where people do things, you know, they're, they're, I'm looking, I'm trying to look at them sort of like a still life or a landscape. And they, I kind of let that kind of, uh, you know, blur, as they say, the definition between those three. But, you know, but it's about it's about looking. It's about looking and it's about being turned on by color and space. Mm-hmm. That makes it makes a lot of sense. It makes me think of, in a way, the idea of not naming what you're looking at. Um, so it's not creating a painting of an interior. It's creating a painting of the shapes and the spaces that just happen to exist in that space? Is that- yeah, I mean, it can never be that pure. I'll start that way, and then something will happen where it, oh, this kind of is me because of the subject in it. I'll still let that kind of happen in the end. You know, like I might be painting my living room, and I've had like a bicycle, and oh, the bicycle is kind of a surrogate for myself. But I'm, I'm starting with maybe I like the colors in the bike frame or the way the, the color is reflected on the uh, the rim of the bike wheel or something like that. It can kind of turn back on itself, and it's it's never one hundred percent that. But the, you know, the idea being, like you're saying, you want it to be sort of like just this pure abstract uh, moment where the colors and shapes just kind of lock together in some way. It doesn't always stay that way, and that can be okay. Yeah, I think what's so fascinating, at least for me, about doing these interviews is what I keep hearing is when I talk to observational painters is how important abstraction is. And even though I would consider you an observational painter, um, is that an accurate description? 
Would you say? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll argue with it too, but I like to do that. Really? I'll argue about anything. I mean, it's sort of like you hear the word observational, and you know, like people say realist or figurative, and um, they're not all the same thing. I guess what I'm thinking about when I say observational is that, and when I say I'll argue with you, it's just because I'm saying I like to argue about art things. But you say observational, and it's that's true. I mean, I, I here's the, the term I kind of like the most is responsive, like I'm responding to something visual. And somehow observational is okay for me, but it's it's uh, if you were saying something like maybe figurative or realist more so, I might question that. You know, like I'm saying, it's not. I don't want it to be, or it's not about the human function of the things that are in the painting or the space. You know, like this is where I live, and it's not a documentary. It's not a documentary. It's not about the historical or social implications of the place. It's just kind of using that to make a painting. I mean, you know, when I make a painting, it's based on just kind of being struck by something in the moment. I don't preconceive them. I don't say I'm I'm the guy who paints corners of the room or something like that. It's just that I see something as I just I'm kind of my mind is wandering and oh, look at that. That would be a great painting. And I see that all over the place. I see that, you know, wherever I go, it doesn't mean that anything can be a painting to me. But if there's a certain complexity and maybe a certain sort of light that interests me, I'll want to make a painting of that. And most of the times, maybe it's impossible or it would be very difficult, you know, like to drag the paints out and go stand in front of someone's front yard or, you know, in the, the doctor's office or something like that, or wherever I may kind of discover a moment. But I'll do that. You know, I've got this great studio here and I'm you know, it's just been a few years. I'm starting to feel like I'm at home in it, and I've, I'm starting to kind of feel like that where I will discover a moment, and then I'll start working on the painting and, almost before I realize it. And it sounds funny to say, but like I – oh, yeah, that could be a painting, but I'm not exactly sure why. And then I put up a canvas or maybe even stretch a canvas aside and start working on it. I'm not quite sure where it's going to go and that sort of a thing. But you know, it, it starts with that kind of uh, you know, visual impulse, and I like the term responsive. Yeah, that makes sense. I have a hard time with the labels because the purpose that they serve is to sort of corral it into at least the ballpark of where you're at. But it's the painters within any particular genre, like if you say observational painter, it's so broad. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can go with it. So I struggle with that. And so I can I can see why that becomes something that's sort of up for debate, what exactly you call yourself. And I often wonder when artists either interviewed by myself or somewhere else are critiqued and somebody says like, oh, John Lee is X. Yeah. If that ever just makes you go, oh, my God. No, I'm not. <laughs> well, yeah, at times. But just like it depends on the social situation. It depends on like, you know, if it's someone in the right way, I might say something. But otherwise, you know, it's just oh, it's fine that they think that. It depends on who it is and what you maybe assume their understanding of art is and so on. Yeah. Uh, so if it was someone who didn't know anything about, you know, painting much at all, they, you know, they can say, "Oh, he's a, he's a still life painter," or something like that. And that's that's fine. I, I won't yeah. That. <laughs> You're not going to throw your paintbrush at him. No, no. I'll break it the next night, and you know, alone in frustration. Yeah. <laughs> You said something that interested me. I'm curious about this. When you're in a situation, like you mentioned, kind of offhandedly, not maybe you didn't mean this literally, but you're in a doctor's office, for example, and you, it's not somewhere that you can set up and paint, but there's something about an observation that you made, or there's something that you think might be an interesting painting. What do you do? I think about it for the moment. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of look at, or I have loved to look at, uh, you know, how artists solve that sort of thing, you know, where they, you know, they might take photos or Degas would recreate it in the studio or Bernard would scribble something on a napkin and then, you know, go in the next room and make the painting from the memory in the napkin. And, you know, and someone else might really fight to get their easel into that place or, you know, whatever. And I, at different times, I have, you know, set up in those places, but I'd rather be alone in the studio or I'd rather be alone at home. I mean, I, I mean, I, I say a studio, I, I haven't had a studio like I have now, you know, it's a great place, but it's uh, three or four years now in the studio. And otherwise I've been painting in, at home and I would see things at home and it was sort of like it was circular, you know, just the studio was the place I would see these things. And so that was enough to feed it. And it's becoming that 
here. I mean, to say a doctor's office, I didn't mean to, because when I first moved in this place, it felt it felt kind of sterile, like a doctor's office. And I brought some clutter in over the years. I was setting it up for still life and doing some still life paintings. But in the last year, I've just kind of painted things that are set up not as a still life and trying to make a painting out of it that is sort of a still life slash interior space painting. What is it about those situations that makes you feel like that's the one I'm going to do? Because it seems like, you know, as you in particular, but I think artists in general, we're we're kind of going through life highly, highly visual and seeing probably like, you know, I see constantly like, oh my God, that'd be a great painting or, oh, that would be interesting to play with. Is there something that makes you say, yep, that one, and you grab the canvas and go for it? You know, it's varied in a way. I mean, it, you know, there's sorts of things that I relate to or, or respond to more than not. It's hard to kind of put them in categories in some way. I mean, I, I used to think of like, you know, uh, the color and shadows that are in mid, a mid range shadow, not a real dark, heavy, like a Baroque shadow, not a real strong light, not a real deep space. Things are kind of in the middle in a funny way because that's where the, the magic is. You know, it's not like it's real obvious, bright, red, yellow, primary obvious colors, nor is it completely dead or dull, but it has some sort of patina and some sort of quality that's through the reflection and through the, you know, as I look at it, I see these, you know, the warm and cool at the same time and the bright and dull at the same time. And, you know, I used to say things like the walls that were painted, you know, I was doing these paintings in the building. It's torn down now, this uh, older uh, science building on campus and, you know, had eight, nine, I, I assume, you know, layers of paint on the wall. And it's a neutral color, the wall anyway, but the, the way the light hits it and the fluorescent lights. And so you got the natural light and you have the, you know, electric light and you get warm and cool and you get that combined with the, the shadow and combined with the paint. And so all those things would blend together and get something that was interesting to me. And so it's situations like that. And it's also just uh, the way things might overlap and the way things kind of lean. I like leaning and I like kind of spaces that are not completely frontal, but not completely kind of crazy and out of control. Uh, and I tend to, you know, before I realize what I'm doing and I set up and start painting, I realize, oh, it's, I love these where it's a little off to the left. It's a little, you know, I'm not right in front of it, but I'm two, three steps to the left or the right. So I'm seeing it at a pitch that is not overly dramatic, but it's not kind of dead on frontal. Usually, there's a lot of that when I paint, especially when it's like an interior sort of a space. And, and there's also kind of inside-outside light and the way that there's a glow to the shadows inside and there's a depth to the light outside. And, you know, that's another kind of a high contrast, but they can come together in surprising ways depending on the time of day, you know, certain reflective qualities. I think of uh, someone telling me about, you know, Leland Bell, who's been important to me. She said that you know she was in her in his class you know back in the seventies or sixties, this painter and she told me that you know he said that paraphrasing maybe but rhythms in nature are endlessly fascinating, and I don't think he necessarily meant nature like trees and you know shrubbery but just that just when you look at the world because to me it's I'd rather be painting something that has at least some architecture in it it could be all architecture it could be not not that it's about architecture it's not like looking at a cathedral or something like that but that it's playing off vertical, horizontal, and geometric planes that may get lost like in the light and shadow uh, and the overlaps and so on. The confusion in that might be very interesting. You know, I I can just kind of sit and start looking around the room and then start to see where the way things kind of line up and lock and play off of each other from different forms in a space uh, becomes interesting. And I kind of want to make a painting of that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before we started recording that you are on a, what's the correct term for it? You, you're taking a break. I'm not teaching this semester. So it's like a research leave. I'm not sure what the exact, it's not a, it's not a sabbatical capital S, but it's, uh, I'm not teaching this semester. So, you know, it's great. I have like, you know, literally nine months from this last January to, you know, August, September to just paint. I mean, I could travel as well. I'm just trying to work on, you know, paintings. And so I'm just kind of traveling to the studio. Exciting. Would you mind talking about what you've been playing with for the last – well, it's only April now, but what you're working on and what you're what you're playing around with? Absolutely. I've got about five paintings going that are about – I usually work in this kind of 30 by 40-ish kind of range, and I don't know how I really got to that. I think it's – you know, if I think about my cone of vision and I extend my arms out 
in that kind of cone of vision world I can really see. And that's that dimension right there is uh, about 40 inches across. And so I uh, kind of like a off rectangle. So in the 30 ish to 40 ish kind of range, or maybe 40 by 42 is this a little bit larger one I'm working on. But there are paintings of just studio spaces, but they're not very deep spaces. I'm trying to make them not be, you know, the room or the workspace, but just maybe a, a painting space. And I started all of them just based on, oh, that should be my painting. It just kind of like in the moment. Okay, that, that's it right there. And not really think about it much beyond that and start making a painting towards it. Even, even if it takes another day or two to uh, put together a canvas. And I tend to do a uh, pre gesso, you know, oil, linen. And so it doesn't take me too long to kind of get something going, ready to go. So that's what I'm working on mainly, and it's uh, you know there's one that I worked on all last spring, and then the kind of the light changed, and then over the summer I was doing uh, a bunch of little salt, small self portraits and some small still lifes, and also recently I did a uh, it took about a month through April to May somewhere in there I made a painting for an upcoming show for the Zeuxis Still Life Association, which I have for the last few years been part of, luckily and honored and all that. I and mean, there's an upcoming show. So I, I made a painting for that. But it relates to what I've been doing with uh, – there was some stuff on the table. Stuff on the table meaning like still – you have a s- sort of impromptu still life? Yeah, and it, it's, it's not set up like someone arranges a still life. I've done that with some success, and I play with it, and I'll play with it a lot. And I might spend like a few days just setting up that. I might change it a little bit as I work on it as I go. But it's also very frustrating because I keep wanting to – I'm not exactly sure. And I like the idea of – like with a landscape or an interior space that I might see as I just kind of go around my day commuting or whatever, You know that energy, like I'm saying, where, oh, look at that. That's kind of interesting visually. I want to make a painting with that. It's sort of like – you know, it doesn't come out of it. I think it relates to you know, like Fairfield Porter who I've liked a lot and uh, gotten a lot from in the past. You know, he'd say something like respect for the way things are. You know, there's something about the way – I mean I love the way things sit and it may seem like this boring thing. I mean maybe I like just boring painting painters, but it's it's uh, just the way things are interests me. Is it kind of like a candid – it's like the, the painting version of a candid photo versus a setup one. It's just the way things happen to be. Without you, yeah, but not the fact that it's just like it could be anything. Like, aha, this is boring, and isn't this interesting because it's dead? Because I don't see it as being boring. I see it as being interesting, and something surprising about the way things kind of the colors in the shadow, or the way, or the way something kind of melts into another. You, you know, the kind of lost and found stuff that is yeah. interesting. But at the same time, it's also about something on the opposite end, which is you know I've been thinking about. Off and on for a while, but you know, someone like Elion, the painter, French uh, Jean Elion, H E L I O N, and uh, this table painting he did. You know, he did abstract paintings early on, and these big shapes are kind of dancing around. He was important to someone like Leland Bell, who's important to me. And he did these paintings in his studio that were kind of straightforward, but they're about the way the parts kind of play off of each other, like one angle catching another angle, a curve catching another angle, and when things pass off one thing to another. He's got this book called Double Rhythm that talks about that, and he relates it to Poussin and the richness of the works of Poussin, the fullness. Uh, And he sees that same kind of uh, fullness in Surratt. And I'm not setting it up like he does, but I want some of that, you know, because I want it to be sort of, oh, look at this light. I'm, I'm drawn to the light first. Uh, you know, the first type of uh, painting I was exposed to came out of the, like the Charles Hawthorne idea, like the color spots and seeing the light and that whole kind of lineage that one might associate with Boston School. And I'm not even really a fan of Hawthorne's work, but I like I like the idea and the the teaching of it and the way it's the lineage of it. And I feel like I've been a part of that. But I'm also interested in this kind of rhythmic shape form, plane, interlock that, you know, is another school of painting. And they're kind of at odds with each other in an interesting way because they're not – one doesn't tend to do the other one. I'm trying to get both in some way because I, I might move some of the stuff in the setup of uh, my space but I – or add to it or take something away. But I want the core of it to be what I discovered. You know, maybe it's sort of like if I write my biography or just what I did last summer. It's about what happened to me and that's interesting maybe. I could write a story about that, but I may play with it. I may not include every 
detail. I may add something, but at the core right. of it is something that actually happened to me. Right. I'd be curious to hear what you see happening among students that you're exposed to now. Do you think that there's a movement at all happening right now or a look to current painters? Is that too big of a question? Maybe. I, I do and I don't pay attention to that. And, you know, I see that kind of stuff maybe more than not, you know, on social media, which is not to downplay it because, you know, quality stuff, you, know, you can get that through whatever channel you want. You know, I'm aware of things, but I don't uh, investigate that stuff too much. You know, I don't know if I'm in an art world. I'm in, you know, Williamsburg, Virginia, and it's uh, – it's great what I have and I love the job and it's, uh, it, you know, it's sort of an island. You know, the, the students I, I work with are uh, very smart and they work hard and they don't necessarily come here to be an artist, but I try to introduce them to some things that I think are important and meaningful. And it's th something I think about a lot, you know. I teach through what I know and I'm not trying to get them to paint like me. They can end up kind of feeling like that and maybe – that's what is – on some level, that's what you're supposed to do because you're trying to teach them what you know. So that's just going to be inherent in it. You know, If you're moving through a certain kind of a, a way of understanding the world visually, uh, you know, ultimately, at least hopefully, I just want them to become more sensitive to – I want them to be aware of structure, visual structure and the excitement of it that's not purely technical nor is it purely conceptual but that it's visual. You know, it's like, you know, wow, look at that. That's exciting. And it doesn't have to be theater. It doesn't have to be personal or social or political for them to be, uh, you know, I think a lot of times people think art is sort of like you learn a skill set so that you can create imagery and then you add the content to the imagery. Uh, and I'm being simplistic uh, a bit, but, you know, that that's kind of what I see in a broad way. And that, you know, you can just kind of be excited by the, the color of that shirt and against that wall. And wow, you know, that's exciting and it's not obvious. You know, it's not exactly what you thought it was. And I try to get people to dig into those worlds, color or space or form or light, which is kind of what I say the mantra is, you know, form, space and light. That's what we're going for in, in you know, different ways. And you know, we might be drawing, we might be using, you know, a limited palette, whatever. But I'm, I'm trying to awaken that kind of sensibility. It's a language. They have background in history or science or math or writing and they've spent years in each of those and other disciplines building up this understanding through you know how these parts interact be it nouns and verbs or chemicals or attraction and repulsion of chemicals and combining to make compounds and different political or social systems and it's the same thing with colors and shapes and planes and space and the picture plane and you know, the canvas and how all that stuff interacts is meaningful. And that's a whole world they haven't dealt with. When you say that they come, that they're not necessarily coming to study art, why are they in your class, do you think? Well, they might take it as a minor. A lot of people take art as a minor here. Some of the minors can be the best artists somehow. You know, I might have someone just, wow, they blow me away and they've had, they take two art classes and then they go on to, to be a you know medical school or a you know agriculture or you know this that and the other they don't come here thinking I want to be an art person as they move into college and at William and Mary but they kind of discover it through just the way the curriculum works where they maybe they have to take a requirement they might be interested in art when we get a lot of people coming in that they have a good strong interest in art but when they take the, those first classes the introductory level classes and they start to hopefully see the abstraction, underlying abstraction, like we were talking about earlier, and something happens. You know, that you're trying to get them to look at things indirectly, and to look at visual relationships. You know, in hindsight, it's really easy to see when there's like a movement and when somebody belongs in it. And I'm just wondering, like, during that time, were people aware that they were in a movement, or did they all just think that they were painting their own thing? And the other piece of that that I think about often is because of social media, the internet, et cetera, et cetera, we can see what other people are doing and be influenced by it much faster than any other time period, I would say. Like, I would say when I went to the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and when I graduated... And for a long time, I could look at somebody's painting and know that they went to Art Center. Right. I had a group show and 
a couple years ago and then someone I work with and he uh, – someone in the show you know, went to the same program and he – oh, he said, he said something like, I can sniff out my own a mile away. Like he knew that they had studied with the same thing and I can see that kind of thing. I, and maybe you're talking about kind of like something like you mentioned like the academy early on. I fight against that, but it's almost like I feel haunted by it too in a certain way. But I also think that, you know, my, I think my primary teaching was before that, the classes I had, you know, early on, which through my father, and it wasn't like I'm trying to paint like my him necessarily, but just that, uh, the kind of things he was showing me that had to do with this kind of color that wasn't talked about at, you know, the academy or kind of the understanding of gesture and structure that wasn't talked about at the academy. I feel like there's more of a mixed bag to me. I, I almost wish I, uh, at times that it was a simpler, like, oh, here's my master. Here's the way I want to paint. And I, you know, I, I kind of feel envious at times. Like, here's what I do. Here's my almost like a formula. I, I'm going to go do this. You know, one can be successful in that way on some level, I think. But I also think more so it's interesting when it's, uh, you know, there's something richer. One of my teachers brought this to light, you know, and I still use it all the time in a, one way or another. But just, you know, great art is about putting these opposite forces together. Visually, it is too, because it's, you know, you're seeing light in the shadow and shadows in the light and you're seeing dullness in the intensity and and you're seeing intensity in the dull colors. And you can go on and on with that, with all these kind of visual ideas. But then great art is is not just kind of plugging along with you know, where you came from, that kind of, you know, maybe it's the same, but also different from the movement idea, you know, because you come from a school mm -hmm. and so you paint like those around you and the more access to the broader world, that's kind of the history of like modernism, uh, however you want to think of modernism, you know, there's access to looking at, you know, art that's happening in other parts of the world much more quickly. I think I took a class on American abstraction, and the idea was that in a Life magazine, there was one of these Picasso 1917 or something like that with a artisan model, a very abstract one. And then you can start to look and see, oh, Stuart Davis and all these different painters uh, were kind of doing that version of it. And of course, you know, you know, de Kooning and Gorky and on and on, which, you know, before the Life magazine type of photograph and coming over and here's Picasso and you know he's got here's this one profile pic and so you get the whole but I, I mean I've always been attracted to that kind of a thinking and how an artist thinks and where they come from yeah. you know I, I can kind of you know look at different people you know I, you know I don't look at what's happening in in certain ways but I've uh like the, the lineage of, uh, you know, I can, I can, I can draw some family trees for you, uh, painters that are working today. Maybe they're a little bit older, you know, and so like Hawthorne to Edwin Dickinson and, you know, Leonard Anderson was important to me early on. And then Dickinson and it's George Nick, who I've liked a lot. And he was a teacher to Catherine Kehoe and Dick Lou, and I like both of them a lot. And I, you know, I've gotten a lot out of Catherine Kehoe and as a teacher, and I've stolen a lot from her website because she has all this great information for teaching. I respond to them. I relate to what they do because I was introduced to that kind of thing early on, you know, the color spot stuff. And then there's, you know, Midwest Paint Group, but then I discovered in about 2000, I was a searching graduate school, Indiana, you know, who went to Indiana and uh, type it up online and you get these resumes and uh, start to see these, uh, the Midwest Paint Group. And they were interested in, you know, this kind of uh, school that was coming out of people like French kind of modernist painters like Elion, like Leland Bell, and one generation talking to another. And it's a figurative work traditional figurative work that is you know informed by abstract thinking and coming off of abstract expressionism and it relates to things like the New York Studio School and kind of an undercurrent as they think it's kind of seen as versus say you know what was happening with uh, you know other other art worlds at the same time yeah I mean the thing that is so interesting it's like with each generation you have more and more of the accumulation of knowledge of painting and more and more influences and it feels like now it's happening instantaneously in more rapid fire like so i think i had a certain advantage or you know people that are sort of in our age range had this certain advantage that when you were in art school you were sort of limited to the instructors that happened to be there at the same time and then the influences of their own lineage. And that felt like more than enough to me to sort all of that out and to make sense of it and to adapt what resonated with me and um, for better or worse, discard what didn't. 
And now it's like a bombardment of all the movements all the time, plus what anyone thinks of and is doing right now. So I think seems like art students now have this sort of added task, I guess, to sort through all that information and understand what's important and what's not. I know what you're saying. and I, I agree with it. I can also think that they don't know who anyone is. I mean, they have access to it all. They have everything right there. I mean, I would raid the library and I love to look all this stuff up. I love to research and from the very beginning, I would go to the library and I'd pull out, you know, old art news and these different magazines going back decades. And, you know, they're bound where you have like a whole year in the mm-hmm. and I would flip through and flip through and just look for, oh, wow, look at this essay. It's really interesting. I might Xerox it or, you know, I, you, you find an image of a painting and you see a lot of bad stuff, too. That's like looking at social media and. But even that was curated by somebody and like yeah. somebody like they had a limit to the number of pieces they could put in it. And they somehow curated it for, you know, whether you agree with it or not, those are the artists that they decided were going to be in there. But now there's no, you know, there's no curation at all. I've had things where like in a class, like, oh, bring in some, I'm simplifying, but like bring in some impressionist painters or something like that. So like Google impressionism and you get, you know, someone does their poodle or something like that and they call it yeah. impressionism. And so- they, they don't know how to discern that. And I've even, like, you look up, you just type in Mondrian paintings. If you know Mondrian, you can go through and look at all the, get, you know, the Google image search comes down. And you, you know, mm-hmm. yes, yes, no, 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 yes, no, no. Because you, you, you can, most of them are not really Mondrian. But right. if you're not familiar at all, you wouldn't know the difference. And so, right. so there's no filters. And people talk about that with music, you know, just there's no filters. You don't have to go through. So I say go to the books. It's great. I'm over in the other building and I have the library right across the way. It just takes me two minutes to walk over to the library. And of course, the art books are the furthest from the door on the third floor all the way upstairs. But I rate it all the time. I mean, I love to do it. And I, I bring the uh, the mountain to the party, however you want to put it. So I, I'll bring over stacks of books all the time and show these to people. And it's not the same impact to me, you know, looking at it on a, even on a, you know, iPad or whatever. And even just to see it that way, you can see it in a, in a book. And like you say, it, it's been curated. It, it's put together by a scholar. I mean, it's true in art magazines. Yeah, you get good stuff, but you can also get a lot of fluff because it may be just someone advertising for a gallery that's not very good necessarily. But in, in a book, it's uh, you get quality stuff. And the only reason people go up to that back part of the library, yeah, that's where the art books are, is they study because no one's up there. It's quiet. But I, I've made a mess of that space up there. I'm pulling all the books out. And uh, I'll have like 150 books out at any time. And I love to kind of show them to students. And I can look at something in their work and run over to the library. And, you know, it'll remind me of something like, oh, you should look at this person. And I've got a lot of my office right there. I can run in and do that. But it's, uh, I know that better than the internet. I mean, the internet's great for a lot of things, for art and for teaching. But I'm able to remember where different images are in my books, and I can kind of just pull it up uh, magically in a way. It was said recently, and just, oh, look, there it is, you know. And, you know, see see what you're doing, see how this, mm-hmm. you know, see what they're doing, get that into your work sort of a thing. I like the books the best, and I, you know, in, anywhere I go, I will, uh, oh, where are the used bookstores, you know? Even if I go to a, a new city and there's a great museum, I'll go to the museum, but I also want to find the used bookstores. And I, I just love to, uh, you know, it's sort of thing where I used to buy records too, and I still do that from time to time. But I will, uh, you know, I, I love to just, I want, oh, wow, look at that book. I've been looking for it for 30 years or something like this. And I, you know, so I've got like hundreds of art books and I'll, I'll get them at the, the public library. We'll sell used books that come in through people donating them regularly on a daily basis. Uh, you can buy them for 50 cents or a dollar, you know. So I've accumulated some interesting mm-hmm. finds and I continue to do it. And it's, uh, you know, it's like a drug habit or something like that. I like to discover these things, but I also, I'm interested in showing it to a student. I'll think, oh, wow, look at that. And that'd be great for so-and-so or the class in general to look at. And I'll get it for that reason. You know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Since you are sort of exposed to a number of students who aren't necessarily in the course because they want to be artists or they don't know yet that that's what they want to do. I'd love to hear your opinion on what role you think art has for the non-artist. Well, 
they don't come to school to be an artist necessarily, but they may discover that. I think I touched on this a little bit earlier. Just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to expose them to a world that they are unaware of. You know, it, it's uh, learning to see, not look. You know, they, they know how to look in order to get through their day and identify and, uh, you know, make their way through their day, not get hit by a car and make a choice. But they have to categorize and name things. You know, I see art as a language and I talk about that with other instructors. Just the same as if someone is teaching writing or Spanish or math, biology, chemistry, political science. But you're teaching them to, you know, you're saying that you're teaching them to see. If they can understand color and light and space and form and, and, and these relationships and that are not about kind of surface or the thing with the name and how they exist in a utilitarian world with that kind of baggage. That's the art world. That's what the art world has been based on forever. Painting, I'm thinking in terms of painting first, but it, you know, it's in, it's part of, you know, every visual art and uh, it opens up that world as well, you know? Yeah. So that, so it, they might be going to a museum now and looking at something and not just saying, Oh, that looks so real. Oh, what great skill that person had, or, you know, look at the story here, you know, look at the uh, historical importance of this. It's something, there's something there that's uh, deeper and surprising and it's exciting and I'm excited by it. So I just, I try to get them excited in the same way, but just through pushing what it's exciting to me. And then it, you know, can uh, exist maybe as a threshold where they may go somewhere else completely different with it in or out of the art world, but maybe it stays there, you know, and, it, and it's important in the way that say, if you're going to be a, a math major and you take some poetry classes, well, that may inform your math in a way that you had never thought of before, you know, and vice versa. So yeah. it's what kind of a, you know, the university idea is, is it not, you know, the liberal arts education, you know, you're yeah. learning about how the world has been understood in different ways and how it's been put together and dissected and analyzed and rebuilt do you ever hear back from your students, from some of these types of students, how taking an art class has maybe changed the way they think or impacted something else? Or do they just kind of go on with their... I can't think offhand in that sense. I mean, I can remember people like, you know, I'll have a color class, for example, and they uh, it finally starts to click in, you know, three years later or something like that. I, I try to do everything I can to get people to understand, and I will, in the class, show them different examples or re-say it in different ways. And I may say some kind of crazy metaphors that make sense to me and maybe don't make sense to them. Uh, I will do everything I can, and it, it will bug me if I don't think they understand it. And I'll lay in bed at night thinking about other ways to understand it, and I'll have kind of conversations in my head about it at 3 in the morning. And I'll kind of bring that back in, or I'll look up another artist, or I'll send them an email, or I'll send the whole class this long email. And trying to find ways to get them into this world and, uh, you know, through the doing too. And I don't want them to just sort of please the teacher. And I think hopefully that I've heard something, but I can't think of a real specific, but just down the line, it starts to make sense. And it's not just them fulfilling the requirements of the class, which they are very good at, you know. And I want them to, you know, discover something that, you know, well, yeah, okay. I'm going to stay up all night and do this because it's exciting. I'm going to do it for the sake of doing it and not just because it's about, you know, a grade or something like that. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. Well, some of the concepts do take time to sink in, even for artists. And that's what I think is so endlessly fascinating about art is that you can hear something and sort of intellectually understand it. And there's a gap between when that sort of appears in your painting or when the true understanding starts to happen. Um, I've experienced this before where I've either talked to somebody or taken a workshop. And then as they're talking or as I'm there, I'm like, oh, yes, of course, that makes sense. And then two years later, I'm working on a painting. And then all of a sudden, I remember something they said, and it has a completely new meaning, which is completely relevant to what it is I'm doing. And it's just kind of like, whoa, now I understand what they were trying to tell me a number of years ago. It's really exciting. And I think that's the part about art that's so fascinating. And it's also kind of weird in a way. I think some people struggle with this 
that they sort of had the voices in their heads of all their past teachers and, and even, you know, maybe biographies of artists that they've read, but there's all these kind of like voices in their head (laughs) because we all have voices in our heads and learning how to tune them in or which ones to listen to and which ones to sort of turn down or fade out so that you can finish what you're doing, or at least um, have some direction while you're painting. This is a question I get a lot from artists who listen to the podcast, which is how do you get rid of the voices in your head of your past instructors, you know, for example, so that you can hear your own and create your own work so that it's not a constant sort of regurgitation of what you've learned before. It kind of goes back a little bit to what we're talking about. I have a little bit of a different take on it. I kind of feel like sometimes you want to turn up the volume on that person and turn it down on somebody else so that you can sort of take what you need from it and disregard the rest. But I'm wondering if you have any insights into that or if you experience that, this idea of you, for example, have all this experience with your father and then everybody that you've worked with and then all the artists that you've studied. Does that ever play into your work? Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, there was, like I went to the Academy and I worked with this, you know, Scott Noel and, you know, this is like 96 to 2000 or something like that. And I was very close to him. You know, there's other people at the Academy that I liked a lot too, but I was very close to him and he was very giving and you can go to his studio and he would talk to you and uh, give you some time. And he's, uh, you know, if you look him up and that's what people always talk about is kind of the energy and that helps, you know, because he's, you know, he's someone who will praise your work if he sees it, you know, when he sees it and uh, give you time of day and more than that. And he was interested in a lot of painters that I was interested in already. And I like the idea that fluence is like you meet someone on the path, not that, you know, you're just walking along and, oh, okay, let's do this instead. And, you know, I don't agree with everything he is about. And I've fought a long time. And I still think about it to this day, but I did paint for a while and it did energize me that, you know, he was kind of like behind me on my shoulder in a sense. And, you know, he was watching me in a sense, uh, like maybe like almost like a, you know, a spiritual sort of thing or, you know, the, the angel on your shoulder. But, you know, I'd go through phases with, you know, like you're looking at different painters and you're doing a lot of measuring or, you know, I'm pushing the color. Or I'm trying to kind of wear these kind of clothes for a while based on artists I'm looking at. And I have a hopefully an honest kind of uh, appreciation for. And I think that it's just a matter of kind of like just over time. But I, I think I still feel like I deal with this. But I, I think what it really comes down to for me is that in the painting, you get to the points where you're just maybe just moving so fast that you don't think about it at all. You're not thinking. You're just kind of going on something like automatic pilot. And you're just kind of following what makes sense intuitively. And that's – when the work feels the truest to me and it doesn't feel obviously like, you know, this or that painter or this or that kind of school of painting, but it's just sort of like, oh, here's what makes sense to me. Here's what it needs to be. And I just keep knocking these things around and playing with the color and repainting and scraping it, but without thinking. I'm not sure if it's a matter of just painting a little more quickly or just kind of putting on, you know, the type of music where I don't have to think about it, you know. You know, I, I can zone out in a way, listen to different podcasts, whether it's about art or it's about, you know, stand up comedians or something like that too, or whatever. But I can also just enjoy music that I've heard a lot, maybe on shuffle in a certain way. And it, it just kind of allows me to it's almost like driving and you're listening to music and you're not quite aware of either one of those things. And um what has worked for me, I suppose. I think it boils down to what are you turned on by, you know, because you're trying to make it through the voice of the other person, whether it's, you know, your teacher or the person you're looking at in a book or online, then it's, you know, isn't it false in some way? But just like what's happening in the painting or in life, if you're looking at life uh, in nature, whatever, that turns you on and you're trying to get that, you know, what is that? And so you want that to be a certain, oh, that's, you know, that doesn't sit. And I want things to sit in a certain way. I want things to kind of like float in another way. And so it's, uh, you just kind of, and again, suddenly I think of like, Graham Nixon in this uh, description on this, you know, those marath- drawing marathons, you know, you will it to be, you know, that's the only answer is you will it to be and like, oh, how do I get this? to? And he, and he just said, you will it to be and kind of walked away, you know, <laughs> and I, I, I like that. That's fantastic. 
I'm going to write that on my board that you will it to be. I haven't heard that one. I did want to touch on a couple of the, the questions that I, that I sent to you because I, I think it's so helpful for both the process and all this, the thought that goes into painting that we've been talking about. But I also am curious if you wouldn't mind talking about if we could kind of go back to after you graduate, let's say after you graduated from college, what were some of the, what were some of the things that you looking back now that you feel like that you did, that you feel like impacted your growth as an artist or your career as an artist, you know, like when you were first starting out, what were some of the things that you did either purposely or accidentally <laughs> that worked out that you think were sort of pivotal? There's sort of like a routine that you go through when you're in college or when you're studying that you're like, okay, I'm doing this to become an artist. And then the next question is always, now what? What do I do now? Right. I mean, I wasn't someone who I didn't have like a real cut and dry experience at all. I mean, I, I, I don't think I anybody didn't, does. <laughs> it's uh, it wasn't, you know, and I, I saw a lot of people who were doing gallery kind of uh, looking at galleries early on. And uh, I didn't do too much of that. Right. You know, I didn't, uh, you know, any kind of court galleries or try to show as much as I could, you know, I might've, tried to show some more. I, you know, I had this idea of uh, just kind of holding up and painting for a while and I did it for at least a, a year or two before I went to graduate school, you know, in Indiana. But, uh, you know, and, and the, the kind of people who I'd studied were, you know, a little bit older coming up to the 60s or something like that. And the whole, I think it was like maybe the Yale school, Janet Fish and Jack Beale and you know, they Chuck Close and Rackstraw Downs and all these different people and George Nick had some association with that, but they, it's just people who were able to just maybe get a day job in some way and paint a lot for a while. And I, I still think that way, which is not to try to jump into having this big show immediately, but to spend some years developing. And so I was thinking like that, I guess, a bit, and that, that's still part of the way I think. You know, so I, I, I was working at restaurants, which allowed me to kind of paint, you know, up until mid afternoon and then going to work. And it was just, in, you know, living in a group house. This is in Philadelphia. Um, so it was cheap living and the kind of romantic thing. It was like a punk rock house or something. And they would have punk bands play downstairs and uh, kind of an eclectic place. But it just, uh, you know, it felt like the art experience. But I'm not sure what the, the best answer is, but I tried to kind of just be a painter and think about growing as a painter and just spending some time doing it. And, it, you know, there's there's a lot of failure with it, which uh, maybe people don't allow for. I don't know. You know, most of the things I've done, you know, the, you know, the large, you know, just gets either painted over or has been painted over or thrown away or something like that over time. You know, so I tried some different things in a certain way. I tried some different routes and uh, different ways of making a painting. And I, I think I'm forever honing what I am really interested in. I think it's, you know, it's very narrowed down in a certain way, the type of thing I'm interested in and kind of schools I'm interested in. But within that, like if you go into that, it seems like there's still a lot that I, a lot of directions that I want to speak to at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, it goes back to what we said, what very similar concept of trying to put a label on an artist and saying that this is a representational painting because that does get you in the ballpark, but there's so much room to move inside of that. So when I think about being a painter and the, in that context, it's kind of like you spend years exploring and developing and throwing out or painting over all the failed paintings are the ones that where the gap between what you envisioned and what ended up on the canvas is just too large. The interesting thing is that as you become more and more specific, your ideas expand. And the world seems even though in a certain way, you're narrowing things down, it also is expanding at the same time, which is this bizarre concept that seems to happen. <laughs> yeah. Maybe more than one person said this, but I think also, like George Nick said, like, you should always feel like you're rising up and climbing up the ladder, but also about to fall over at the same time. You know, it's like, you, uh -huh. you should always have this kind of the floors slipping out from you as you progress forward. 
and that even relates back to the kind of drawing idea of two steps forward and one step back. You know, and I like this idea in a painting itself too, which doesn't get explored, which is enough to me, or it's my prejudice, and it doesn't happen with students. And I, you know, like if a painting in its final cut is like a ten-year-old, and that's when it's done, is when it gets to age ten. The ages between like two and six need to be really explored, and people want to jump up to the final stage and kind of just make that finished thing. And mm-hmm. I like this idea of kind of you know churning it and keep pulling the the bottom back up, and you know because I don't know where it's going to go or what it's going to need until I can kind of take it to a certain place, and that may mean moving something, you know. So, but I have to kind of put more information in terms of like the color and the light or something like that into it and fill it up some before, and then oh I need to undo and so it's like there's this kind of breathing and back and forth that is interesting and frustrating but it's I mean I, I just like this idea of making a painting that's uh, you know there's another project where you know people teach in university kind of settings and they can make it work for them but they might do a kind of work that they can do like on a one day or a two or three days of the weekend, and it's maybe smaller. It may be from life. It may be abstract or whatever. There's beautiful work can be made that way. But I like this idea of you know, I'm teaching, but I still want to do something that is uh, complex and large in a certain way. Not large like you know, I'm trying to be in a museum or something like that, but just it has a, a fullness. And you know, I want a lot of things. I want to speak to them. I don't, I don't come in saying that, but as I'm working, I find that. And so, you know, and I, and I think about certain painters who I think have made paintings like that. That you know, I've got kind of you know, a list of painters that I like, and with them, paintings that they've done that is in this kind of space you're talking about, which is they've kind of graduated, they've went to school, they're on their own, and they they haven't found what you think of as being their signature look, but they're making something that to me is often more interesting. It's this kind of work that's before they become the, who they are. It's uh, something that feels very real and it's attainable and it's relatable. You know, I could think of like paintings and kind of spaces and time by people like Matisse or Hopper and Jack Beale. And I was thinking about this a little bit earlier today and Catherine Murphy and there's all these type of paintings that are in this moment that are really rich. And I feel like that's the type of painting I want to make, which is, um, you know, it, it's almost like the, you know, before the band becomes who they are, when you think of them, it's like the the pre-sellout kind of space or something like that. And that's not really the right way to put it. And it's not to say that these artists are selling out in any way, but just, uh, it's just a way to kind of relating what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's like the Beatles at Hamburg. Yeah. Very cool. John, thank you so much for doing this with me. That was a really fascinating conversation. I uh, enjoyed it very much. I've wondered if, you know, oh, would I ever be, you know, asked to uh, be on this podcast? And so it's uh, kind of funny the way things work. Thanks again to John Lee for taking the time to share his insights. If you want more information about anything that we talked about on this episode, you can go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. You'll find show notes there, plus links to all of the artists that John mentioned and examples of John's paintings. They're gorgeous. You definitely want to go check them out. And if you want to see more of John's work, you can go to JohnLeePainting.com. But while you're over there at SavvyPainter.com, make sure that you don't miss an episode of the podcast. You can sign up for show updates and free guides right there in the sidebar at SavvyPainter.com. The Savvy Painter podcast is made possible in large part by listeners like you. If you'd like to help out, it's quick, it's easy, and it's a huge help to the show. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash support. And with that, I have some very, very special people to thank. Without these people, this podcast would not exist. So a big shout out goes to Susie Zefting Kuhn, Teresa Hill, Alchemy Works, Sharon Jonas, Denise Glitzy, Dev Cook Shapiro, David Gorski, Carolyn Green, Roxanne Darling, Joanne Robinson, Pat Oxley, Jill Opelka, Kathy Speranza, ZB Gallery, Andy Doby, Dina Stavini, Wright Design, Jiyoung Kim, Don Chandler, Gabrielle McDermott, Lori Chanel, Deb Anderson, The Roaring Artist, Ruth Kalb, J.A. Moore, and Shirley Williams. Thank you so much for your support of the podcast. 
Lastly, just a quick reminder that Savvy Painter will now be every other week. So until next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thanks so much for listening.